question. My name is Sidanva. I have been at Microsoft for six years, been working on everything from distributed systems to embedded Linux, to now working on Azure Linux, which is our own distribution that we will talk to you about. Um, I'm a senior PM. It's my Twitter handle. I do work at Microsoft. I just thought I'd put my Twitter handle up and I'll let Olivia introduce herself. Hey everyone, I'm Olivia. I've also been working at Microsoft for like four-ish years now, just on the Azure Linux team. It used to be called Mariner, CVL Mariner, so you might have heard of that. Um, that is not my Twitter handle. <laughs> I don't have Twitter, but yeah, let's get started. Uh, so today we'll talk to you about our learnings from building a Linux distribution. So to many people's surprise, Microsoft does have its own Linux distribution akin to Amazon Linux or any of the other distributions that you're familiar with. And our goal today is to just share our learnings with you and uh, cross engineering product and working with the community and, and what we learned with it. So the agenda, um, talk a little bit about our strategic learnings, engineering, product. I'll try to do a live demo with um, the connectivity we have. And if it doesn't work, I have a backup recording. Uh, and then hopefully tons of time for Q&A. So it may surprise people to know that Linux is actually the dominant distribution or operating system at Microsoft. So over 60% of the workloads on our cloud are actually Linux workloads. And we run uh, any distribution you want, but there's a few select ones that we do partner with. Um, a lot of them are represented here in the expo hall. So Alma, Rocky, SUSE, Fedora. Uh, these are all distributions that run on Microsoft uh, comfortably. But, so why did we need uh, a distribution of our own? Like, why did we decide to build one? Um, the challenge we ran into was first party teams that were using Linux for their own services had a lot of choice to, to pick from. And we had a lot of fragmentation in distributions, a lot of different versions. Anytime there were security issues, it was really hard to track down which services were impacted because everyone's using different versions and di different distros. And so we landed on building our own Linux distro, but we, there were still open questions on how do we build this Linux distribution. And I'll pass it off to Olivia to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we had a few options here. The first one was we could just buy an existing Linux distro. This would give us an instant access to an existing user base, quicker market entry, um, and we could utilize existing partnerships. But then we might face like integration challenges with existing Microsoft products. We might get some resistance from the Linux community. Uh, there's also licensing costs um, and licensing issues around contract negotiations. Uh, second option was forking from a mainstream Linux distro like Rocky or Alma. Um, this allows for customization, it maintains maybe more community goodwill, um, potentially speeds up our development, whereas cons are around um, community backlash, uh, limited differentiation unless we make significant enhancements, and then it can be challenging to tailor for Azure needs due to existing package dependencies. Um, so for option three, that was what we ended up going with. This was building from scratch. So this allowed us to have complete control over the design, architecture, and features of the distro. Um, we were able to seamlessly integrate with Microsoft products, and we were able to tailor the distro for Azure use cases. Uh, the cons, which we experienced, was lengthy development time. So for about two years, we were developing this distro before we started having like our initial set of users. Um, lack of existing user base. We'll talk a little bit about our growth of our product, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then risk of failure. So it could just fail, not gain traction in the market. Next slide. So this is kind of introducing um, Azure Linux. This is a fun article about it. It is recently um, available for GA as of, I think, about this time last year. <coughs> so what is Azure Linux? It's our open source Linux distro at Microsoft. I mentioned it was developed about four years ago. We'd like to thank the upstream communities that allowed us to build it. Um, again, because we were able to build it from scratch, it helped us optimize for Azure, seamlessly integrate, allowed for faster feature development. Um, internally at Microsoft, we use Azure Linux a few different ways. We use it as an AKS node, um, containers, VMs, WSL, and then also bare metal. Um, Azure Linux as the AKS node and then the .NET and OpenJDK containers are currently the only thing we have commercially available or like externally available today, but the other ones are on our roadmap. Um, and we have a rich ecosystem of users from like Linux enthusiasts to over a thousand enterprise customers using um, the AKS node. Just some benefits around it are secure supply chain. Um, we can build everything from source, validate it ourselves, robust testing. So we work with the Azure or the AKS team so we can ship left with testing and catch issues um, before they occur. 
um, support. So you only have to work through kind of one team at Microsoft now um, for any feature requests. Um, performance, Azure Linux allowed us to tailor an image that was really lightweight. So we're only at 500 packages. This helps with performance on cluster operation times. And then security. So right now, major versions of Azure Linux have about a two-year life cycle. Um, packages and images are released. Pa images are released about once to two times a month. Packages, according to our SLA, which we'll talk about how we define that. Um, and we have independent security audits run with each release, and we pass all the CIS level one benchmarks. And then the next few slides get into our engineering learnings. Um, so let's start with lifecycle. So when deciding the life cycle of our major releases, we're kind of pulled in two directions. Um, shorter life cycles allow us to stay on the bleeding edge, so we could release like the latest kernel, the latest packages. Um, however, longer life cycles allow us to be confident that the packages are stable before we incorporate them into our OS, and that users with LTS needs are satisfied. Um, another item that we kind of learned along the way was just how long it takes to get FIPS certification for a new major release, as well as get all like partners to support and test the next major OS version. Um, FIPS certification taking about 12 months from the preview of our release and then needing to give our existing users about six months to migrate. Um, we decided to make our life cycle about 18 months. However, realistically, it's been more like two to three years um, due to those needs for LTS and certifications. Um, to stay more on the bleeding edge, we've added support for multiple versions of common packages like Python and Go, um, giving users the flexibility to choose you know, if they want a newer version. Um, any questions on this slide or any of the ones I've been on? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for Azure Linux on bare metal servers, mm -hmm. is there any intention for that to be like a GA release or is that pretty much going to be internal only for Microsoft? Um, right now we have like Azure Operators Nexus using it. Yeah, it's mainly internal and actually the demo I'll show is going to walk you through how you can build your own ISO VHDs and mm -hmm. VHDXs. So right now we don't offer like commercial support for that, but if you try things out and you want to file issues, like we'd absolutely engage. We have a lot of people actually trying to get things running on Raspberry Pis and yeah. stuff like that, so. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Stig images for government use? Yes, we do. Right. Olivia, the, Olivia works really closely. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. um, AKS node images are, they have all like the Stig hardening applied, so they're like FIPS and FedRAP compliant. Cool. Um, okay. Trying to do two laptops here, probably not the best. Uh, way to do it. Um, so for CVE, ma CVE maintenance, um, this slide goes over our publishing process from first establishing like what we wanted our CVE SLAs to be and then down to improve discoverability so that we weren't getting pinged with questions all the time for updates. <laughs> so for CVE SLA, um, we decided this initially through backwards planning. So we needed to allow time for our developers to first identify the fix, evaluate it, implement it, have the PR um, reviewed by a peer to ensure it's complete. Um, then they needed to go build the package, put it through our test pipeline, sure they aren't causing regressions or breakage. Um, as such, we kind of decided for our SLA to be around five days for critical CVs. Um, we're always looking to bring that down. Like long term, would love to have like a 24 hour CV goal. Um, this has been pretty hard. Even five days has been hard for our team to achieve. It requires a lot of resourcing, both to like staff our queue and then also to train um, engineers on fixing CVs as our team grows. Uh, the next is a publishing an OVL file. Um, initially, we designed our OVL file to comply with like a major vendor that Microsoft uses uh, when our product was only available internally. But this kind of bit us because as we started gaining external traction, we had other security vendors come in wanting to add support, and they required different configurations of the OVL file. So this had to lead to us very carefully like introducing changes to not break that first vendor. Um, and our learning here, which is echoed in other areas of today's presentation, I think Sadaba has a full slide on it, is to just be mindful when making decisions about code that will be ingested by other vendors rather than prioritizing speed to add support for just one vendor. And then getting into publishing the fix. Um, so we both uh, patch the main package that contains a vulnerability, um, which is a primary step of addressing the security issue. But a lot of Linux packages, as you guys probably know, contain dependencies on other packages. Um, these pack <coughs> dependencies may either be like statically linked or dynamically linked. So when patching the main package, it's also important to ensure that any embedded dependencies are also patched to ensure the entire stock software stack is secure. So one of the decisions we had to make was to choose between static and dynamic linking, um, which refers to how dependencies are linked in the main package. 
Um, in static linking, all dependencies are depending all dependencies are patched and up to date, but it can also lead to larger executable sizes and potentially slower performance. Whereas dynamic linking allows for executables and more flexibility, but it might require additional effort to make sure all the dependencies are patched. So mm. ultimately, when with static linking, um, this allowed us to thoroughly address security bonds and an analyze the entire software stack without um, just doing like the main package. And then the last one on here is improved discoverability. So at Microsoft, we found that a lot of teams wanted to kind of look up the status of their CV. Um, they were only given a vulnerability ID and alert, so we had to link that to a CV and a corresponding package. And this kind of just allowed them to self-serve rather than pinging Sadaf and I all the time asking for updates. Thank you, the next one. Cool, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our learnings with default configurations. So as you can see, uh, one of our core learnings was changing default configurations in core components um, really hurt um, our downstream users. So because Azure Linux is used across all of those different environments we talked about, um, what we think is a straightforward default change um, is not something that someone else uh, thinks is a straightforward default change. One example, uh, one of our distributions for AKS had enabled AppArmor initially, and then we switched that from AppArmor to SE Linux because there was a Microsoft-wide mandate to actually switch from uh, one to the other. So no one should have been using um, AppArmor, but when we did that, there were still customers affected by it. The other classic example is naming. So Olivia touched on how the name was initially CBL-Mariner. That was what we had when it was an internal distribution that we went public with GitHub. When we took it to market, um, marketing uh, got involved and we changed the name to Azure Linux, uh, which is, you know, in my opinion, still a good name. But when we did that, we had to change, or we will have to change the name in like SCOS release. But the problem is so many teams internally take a dependency on that to for their build systems. So it's causing a whole bunch of breakages and it's, we're finding it really hard to actually change the name. Uh, third one, um, as I talked about, any disruption is a bad change. Uh, I'll give another example that just happened a few weeks ago. So we have a set of system D services like any distribution that start on default in our image. And the one that caused the problem was crony D. It's the one that um, syncs to the um, time server to get the time. And customers started noticing drift. And one of the missing pieces in our uh, crony D service file was that restart wasn't always set to always. Um, and we thought, okay, it's straightforward fix. We can just set the restart to always. If crony D goes down, it should just come back up. Um, but it turns out people had worked around this um, in, in many ways. And by us just doing uh, what we thought was a harmless fix uh, was actually a breaking change for some of our customers. The last one is package managers matter. So we actually, because we're an RPM distribution, we went with TDNF um, as our package manager for Azure Linux 2.0. We ran into a host of issues with TDNF and with the next version of Azure Linux, which is coming out um, sometime later this year, it's in preview uh, right now, we're gonna switch to DNF. Uh, and I think that's in line with what most people are used to on uh, RPM-based distros. Next, I'll share a few learnings about working with the community. So uh, some things that people not, may not be aware of, um, we actually internally at Microsoft consume a ton of open source projects. So 60K open source components. We have, all of us have, especially after the acquisition, the GitHub IDs associated with all of our work. Uh, and there's a ton of repos, including Azure Linux that are publicly available on GitHub. So what are the, some of the things we learned? Project maintenance is fairly difficult. So we have a set of internal repos and workflows when teams file bugs on us. And externally, people can also file issues and we encourage people to file issues. Uh, one of the fundamental challenges we ran into was how do you combine those two workflows? So you know, engineers at Microsoft will typically look at their internal tickets uh, on DevOps, uh, but we still need to give love to the GitHub issues in order to grow the project. So this is a learning we have, something we're still trying to get better at. Two, uh, if you see a functionality missing in a project, uh, I have a specific one here for System D because we are so involved in confidential computing at Microsoft, we wanted to add support for uh, booting with v uh, virtual TPMs, and we wanted to just upstream that to System D. Uh, so instead of maintaining a fork and doing it ourselves, we found it easier to actually work with the community to, to upstream it. Uh, three, small bug fixes. So if you see, um, 
areas where you, there are small bug fixes that you can change the config yourself. Uh, what we've learned is it's easier to upstream the fix, so not only everyone else in the community benefits, but from a purely selfish point of view, it actually helps you uh, because you don't need to maintain forks and you know start backporting patches every time uh, something changes. And the fourth one, there are tons of things Microsoft's involved in internally, which are called special interests. So very recently, we started looking into um, live checkpoint and restore of containers. So you take a running container, you snapshot it, you move it to a different node, uh, and you start it up at the same state. And when we started this project, we noticed that there was already SIGs out there that were looking at this. Uh, so one of our core learnings is, instead of you know starting from scratch and trying to do things yourself, look out for SIGs that exist in CNCF or the Linux Foundation or any other GitHub place and, and go and contribute there. Tooling and build challenges. Um, so as Olivia mentioned, the decision we took was to build packages from scratch with our own tool chain. And the challenges we ran into this uh, with this was uh, many fold. Uh, first, uh, we have a lot of older versions and our internal customers at least don't like us bumping major versions of packages. They really like the stability. So what we do is we maintain old versions of packages and we backport fixes from upstream communities where possible. Two, the ability to bootstrap the image. So you'll see when I do the demo right after this, um, we try to minimize the set of dependencies you need to actually start. So if you're building a distro, you're gonna have to build it on an existing distribution or system, and you wanna make sure the dependencies that you need to build your distribution are limited. And three, this is something that's still ongoing. Um, you'll see in my demo that I'll gloss over this because builds take a long time still. So when we're building, uh, tens of thousands of packages, um, you're pretty much creating a humongous graph and then you're trying to do uh, graph optimizations to build these packages. Uh, this is something we're still working on um, to actually improve performance. So to show this demo, I am going to flip over to first my desktop. So this, these are the dependencies that I was talking about. So this is on an Ubuntu machine. I can zoom in because I know I sat in the back in some of the sessions and it's hard to see. Um, but those are what you're looking at to get started. Uh, what I will show you in this demo is how you can go to our GitHub repo, um, Microsoft slash Azure Linux on GitHub, and you can build your own ISO. And then you can boot that in um, whatever system you want. So here I have um, a machine. Uh, it's actually a cloud box uh, at Microsoft, but it's, it's Linux. I've cloned the repo. Our builder, it looks at a JSON file to look at the set of packages that you want to have. So there's a package list, which is going to contain the list of packages in the distro. There is going to be a post install scripts you can run. In this case, it's actually not doing anything. It's just there for demo purposes. Uh, the kernel, uh, whether you're using the default kernel or not, uh, and then any additional files you want to add to the file system. Before I kick off the make, I'm gonna show the actual package lists. So if I go to demo package lists, um, sorry, if I go to demo, so you'll see that there's two package lists, there's core packages and the UFE bootloader. So I'll go to the core packages and you'll see that there are two packages that are gonna be part of this ISO file that we build. Inner MFS, you needed to actually start the system. And then there's another one called core packages, dash base dash image. This is actually an umbrella package for a list of core packages. Now, where are all of these? When I kick off the build, our build system is going to look for three optimizations. First, it's going to look on your local machine. If you build your own versions, it's going to pick those. Two, it's going to pick from the cache that you have. Or three, which is what this demo will do, it's we have a package repo, packages.microsoft.com. It's going to go fetch the pre-built packages from there. <coughs> So I'm gonna kick this off, and before I do, I'll just show you, the, I'll talk about the command briefly. So you'll see it's a make command. Uh, let me zoom in. Uh, so all of our builds is done with make files. Um, you'll see it's make ISO. The two configurations I wanna talk about are rebuild tools, it's set to Y. So I'm gonna rebuild our tool chain as part of this build, and rebuild packages is set to no. If I set this to yes, this is where the performance optimization I talked about kicks in and we'll be here for a long time. So I've set now here. I hope if I was in the right folder. 
So I'm not going to wait for this to finish because it can take some time, but I'll, I'll just briefly touch on what happens. The first thing that happens is we're going to bootstrap the tool chain. The Azure Linux tool chain, um, in this case, we're not building it from source in the GitHub repo. We're, again, we're going to pull this from uh, our package repo where it's pre-built. You could modify the tool chain and build it from source and then use that. Then it's going to actually go ahead and build the ISO. So in this example, it's going to go fetch the core packages, base image, init RAMFS. Um, and it was fast because I'd ran this before and it just picked it up from the cache. But if you want to see where it actually is, um, go to the out folder, images, demo ISO, uh, and you'll see the one I built when I was testing this earlier and then the latest one, which is just now. So with this ISO, you can go boot it um, and you can do this on your Ubuntu machines uh, today. All right. Um, I will hand it off to Olivia, who's going to talk a little bit about some of our product learnings. Yeah, before we get into this, does anyone have any questions on that demo or engineering learnings? Yeah. yeah um, why did you switch from uh, Armor to SNRX? Uh, so we had to pick one Mac framework to standardize on. We had a lot of maintainers from, or a lot of folks who were familiar with SE Linux from the upstream community, so we just picked that. Um, so. In our next version, so our Azure Linux 2.0, we actually support both. And we've gone into really bad situations where people actually have end up having both, mm -hmm. and then they start conflicting. Mm -hmm. So in the next one, we're just going to pick one. It's just going to be SE Linux. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what do you guys do for kernels as far as like keeping track of like certain branches that you're tracking, or how do you kind of work with that one? Okay, I can. Okay, so <laughs> actually our kernel maintenance is kind of, uh, I don't want to say messy, it's just a lot of work. So. We have a ton of Linux kernels that we maintain across all these uh, flavors. So um, one of the things I didn't show uh, that I could was our system right now is the 515 um, kernel. So what we do is we have a team, uh, the Linux systems group, that is closely in tune with the upstream uh, Linux kernel that looks for like CVE security patches that are going into the later versions of the kernel and we backport it to, to 515. When we do major versions of our distro, so the next one I mentioned is coming out this year, we take the opportunity to bump it. So we're gonna bump to 6.6 um, uh, for the next one. But for the, during the life cycle, we just backboard patches uh, where possible. And we're trying to cut down on the number of kernels we have, because right now we have a lot across WSL, a, a Kubernetes, and blah, blah, blah. Questions? Okay, so the next couple of slides um, are on our product learnings. So positioning, growth, and then I think Sadam is gonna go over like operational learnings. Um, so when we launched Azure Linux externally, we kind of had to decide on a few things. One was, do we launch every use case at once, like our containers, VMs, NKS nodes, or do we release just one first? If so, like which one do we release first? Um, so we decided that launching all of them at once would probably not be the best decision because um, it would surely overwhelm our support team. Um, by launching just one, it gave us the option to kind of slowly ramp up and make sure we're developing um, like an excellent support experience for our users. Um, by choosing one product release, uh, we decided AKS. It solves a well-defined problem. So with AKS, there's only really like one image that users can choose um, and we're able to tailor this image um, for Azure use and for Kubernetes use, um, solving that problem. Uh, most AKS users don't customize this image at all. So we were pretty confident that we already had support for the majority of packages needing, needed, whereas launching a container or VM would have caused like an influx of package requests. Most people are customizing them. Um, additionally, in AKS, there's only two operating systems to choose from, Windows and Ubuntu. Um, so it wasn't yet overwhelmed with uh, choices for users to choose. And AKS had a solid existing user base. Um, so because of that, that's kind of why we chose that one. Um, the last point is that AKS's partner base was well understood. Um, so we know like which vendors we need to work with first to add support. A couple learnings here. Um, a non-trivial number of users do actually customize the host in AKS and install daemon sets, kernel modules, etc. Um, and also partners have different ways of installing their software. It could be like containers, daemon sets, etc. Um, overall, by launching one use case and one we were really familiar with, it allowed us to understand our staffing needs better and helped us develop frameworks within our team for how do we want to prioritize future requests and scale that out eventually to our containers and VMs, which we will launch. Um, and then to summarize the learnings, just watch out for edge cases. Users will probably be doing interesting things with your product that you didn't know about. 
Um, for growth, when we started this journey with Azure Linux about four years ago, um, we prioritized two main work streams. One was grassroots adoption and one was like high touch customers. So for grassroots adoption, our first stage was really just awareness. Like, do people even know about this distro within Microsoft? So that was creating product documentation. So that showed up when users would just like search Bing um, Linux. Having Azure Linux shown up in like bootcamp slides for new hires, crashing community calls of other teams within Microsoft like .NET and AKS who already had a large uh, user base, and then also getting Azure Linux in their documentation, and then just various presentations internally like Cloud Talks. Um, once users were aware of Azure Linux, we kind of pivoted to more creating urgency around it by showing people what the benefits were. So we started publishing performance numbers, quality metrics. We showed examples where we could streamline support um, on feature requests. And we basically had to convince all these teams within Microsoft that migrating their OS was more important than their application work um, that they had already going on, which, as you can imagine, is probably a challenge. Um, this grassroots adoption was done in parallel with a few high-touch customers. Um, these people already had like existing applications with a lot of usage already, but they maybe had one to two really big problems. Like maybe they had performance issues or with the existing Linux distro they're on, they were burned by a bad patch that caused their service to have downtime. So we worked really closely with them to tailor our product for their experience and for Azure's experience. Um, and this kind of got us to a point where we had like a few, like solid set of users, kind of still small, but we felt like most of the gaps in our OS were um, fixed at this point. And then we kind of moved towards finding ways to scale. So um, internally at Microsoft, we did this through a few different compliant initi compliance initiatives. So one of their goals was just like securing the supply chain, ensure consistency in platforms. We heard this at the Meta um, talk earlier today as well. Um, so this basically alerted or manifested into an alert uh, for internal teams to migrate to Azure Linux. Externally, we can't really send out alerts. So we're doing this through different ways, trying to drive our field team to become advocates for Azure Linux, and then eventually become the default um, Linux distribution in AKS. So if you just spin up a cluster, it will have Azure Linux by default. Um, and then some things inhibiting our growth so far have been feature parity with other distros. Users are risk adverse with upgrades. They just don't want to upgrade. Um, they like what they're using, which is fine. Um, and then others, users maybe want to have one distro across all their use cases and all clouds. Azure Linux is currently only commercially available for AKS and Azure, so that could be another issue. Thank you. Next one. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our learnings in building a community. So after we released the distribution for public via AKS, we started getting a lot more engagement with um, external users. So people who were not just interested in our offering with Kubernetes started going to our GitHub page and, as I showed, started building ISOs and doing stuff with it. So we realized it was important for us to have good communications and just good workflows with the community. So some learnings. Um, one is you want to start small, but you want to really make sure that your GitHub page has solid quick starts, tutorials, and uh, documentation to get people started. So right now in our GitHub page, um, there is a quick start that just explains, you know, as I showed, what are the prereqs you need, and then you can build an ISO. And that should take you like five to 10 minutes tops. Two, um, being responsive is super important on issues. Um, we are actually learning this uh, a little bit through pain. Um, we had an issue just last week where uh, someone uh, got a little bit upset with us that we didn't respond to them um, in a timely fashion on uh, an issue. But responding to issues, whether it's on GitHub or other socials, is important to keep the community engaged. Three is transparency. So as of, I think, last month, we have a public feature roadmap on our GitHub so people can see what we're working on. Uh, what are we doing in terms of uh, in internal stuff? So we even share, hey, you know, we're working on a new FIPS image um, for this use case internally. Um, external users don't really care for the most part, but it's still something that we strive to do. Four is community calls. So this QR code will take uh, an ICS file for you and just create an event. But we started doing community calls, which have actually been surprisingly well attended. So the first one we did was, I think we had roughly 10 people. Uh, we did a second one just last month where we had uh, almost double the amount and we had people engaged. For the next one, we actually have someone who's external to Microsoft doing a demo of the Raspberry Pi that I was talking about. Um, so that's pretty interesting. 
Uh, five, just attend events like the, these and uh, spread the word, learn uh, about the community, super important. Um, and the next step, our GitHub repo right now is also where our engineers work most of the time. And the challenge that poses for someone new to the repo, someone new just trying to get up and running, is it's fairly heavy. So if you, know, if you looked at my uh, demo earlier and I expanded the specs folder, you would see 10,000 specs. There's a ton of image configs there. Uh, people don't need all that. We only need that for our use. So what we're working on is a repo that is much smaller, that's community driven, that's like a tutorial for getting people started. Uh, and that will just contain the bare bones for you to build an ISO. And then, you know, maybe next step is how do I add a new RPM myself and then rebuild uh, a new ISO. So walking through what people in the community would want to do. Uh, the last thing, uh, operation, operational learnings. Um, some of the things we've learned in working with uh, other external uh, communities and projects is uh, subject matter experts really help. Uh, so as our team's grown and we've uh, compiled roughly 10,000 packages, we found a few that are super critical. We already talked about the kernel. We have a full team of kernel developers. But beyond that, there's a few projects and binaries, things like systemd, containerd, runc, that are critical for not just us, but all our customers as well. So having experts who know the configs of these um, packages and these software deeply uh, really helps. Uh, and the last one is uh, scaling. So I know this is uh, can't be said enough times, but investing in good docs, troubleshooting guides pays off because as soon as we released our product externally, one of the first challenges we ran into was we had a huge influx of support requests come in and for, especially for Linux distributions, right now we're in a constrained environment with Kubernetes where everything's running containers. So as long as you have the container D bits, it's good. But once we make our offering more commercially available with VMs, uh, having really clean documentation like some of the other distros have is, is super important. So we wanted to keep this one to 30 minutes because uh, we're the last session. I know people have been um, in, in talks all day. Uh, but here's how you can stay connected uh, with us. We have the community call. Um, if you saw the QR code earlier, uh, check out our uh, feature roadmap on GitHub. You can go to uh, our GitHub page for quick starts as well. Um, and if you want to use the actual product with AKS um, and you have some like pre Azure credits, you can do that. And you can spin up your own Azure Linux AKS cluster uh, and just play around with it. I think that's all we had. Thank you for coming. Yeah, that's all we had. Awesome. And we're here for questions. Questions? So, um, yeah. I've met Microsoft for 20 years, but I've been coming to this event for about 10. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to encourage Microsoft HR to come out here because there may be a lot of people that think that working at Microsoft and doing Linux is like orthogonal. And maybe you might want to speak towards uh, the environment of Linux now as people working at Microsoft. Yeah, I can probably speak to that. So, yeah, I've been on our team since we basically started this distro. Initially, it was like a lot of Windows developers that came over. Um, and we've done a lot of effort to like recruit new people um, from different Linux distros that exist today to really build up our, our team and our community and focusing a lot more on like community efforts, I would say. Yeah. rather than just enterprise use. And and then Sadamba mentioned a bunch of upstream efforts that we've been trying to contribute to as well. So I think it's like getting better. I don't think we're like fully there yet, but um, mm -hmm. we're definitely trying to put more emphasis on that, attend these events, talk to people, meet people, that kind of thing. Right. So I just encourage people in the room, you're looking at uh, career opportunities that you might want to put Microsoft kind of on, the, on your yeah. card. Yeah, we're always hiring in our team and always growing because our product is growing. So. Feel free to reach out to Saddam or I if you're interested. Yeah, and even the, the dev box, the cloud box that I showed uh, the demo from, you know, previously that way that may have been built for like Windows first, but now it, it's not only Windows Linux, but also a bunch of distros in, in Linux. To, to, and that's how many internal Linux developers there are at Microsoft. And also I have a Mac um, <laughs> that, that, I'm, that, that, I'm, that I'm using for the demo. So it's, it's come a long way uh, in terms of how the, the company's grown. Yeah, you fine. should have seen me walking into my first meeting at Microsoft with my MacBook Air during the bomber days. Oh. <laughs> I got a lot of F-bombs thrown 
Yeah, yeah. Oh we were gosh. brave for doing that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It has changed so much now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the Hong Kong DevOps guy from Microsoft was a show. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned two things earlier in the talk. Um, one is that you have a <coughs> one fixed CVEs within five days. Mm -hmm. Two, everything is statically linked. Yes. So either one in uh, isolation is probably reasonable, but, but put the two together, and all of a sudden you've got a pretty big job in your hands. How do you track? Yeah. Um, if, you know, we need a libz um, as a security failure. How do you track which packages need a rebuild, and is that a, a, an issue in in real life in, in rebuilding everything? When that's it definitely is. It's something that like our team has been struggling to consistently do, like hit that five day SLA by statically linking. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with NIST where we get all of our information on like CVEs and stuff. Um, currently today, whatever NIST rates the CVE as is what we take as like true. Whereas I know um, companies like Canonical, they kind of do their own rating for CVEs. So we're looking at like maybe eventually getting to that spot where we work with MSRC to like review the CVEs and rate them ourselves. Um, that might kind of help with that as well. So how do you track uh, dependencies though? Because um, um, in a dynamically looking case, you just update libz, whatever, and then everything gets it automatically. But uh, what sort of tooling do you use to, to track that? I don't know the name of the tooling, do you? No, I don't. The, oh, but on CVEs, uh, one thing with NIST, it's a learning on the fly, is due to the recent like budget constraints, NIST actually changed the way they were publishing CVE data, and we lost a lot of info that we were getting from NIST for CVEs. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we learned very recently is to use multiple security scanners. So one of the ones that we use is, for example, um, Prisma, and we use that to scan our packages, and it actually does a deep scan of all the Go modules that are linked into um, certain binaries. So that's, w and we actually missed those previously. So in many cases, like if there were like, if there was a binary, say like Kubernetes, and it has a lot of Go modules that are linked statically, uh, we would miss CVEs in those. Um, but one of the things we learned is use multiple security scanners to miss the, you know, some of the statically linked issues that you've cached. Go ahead. I saw a slide where you had a FreeBSD logo. What do you do with the FreeBSD? I think that was the slide where I talked about the distros Linux that we support. Yeah. I, we don't use FreeBSD internally, but if a customer came, we would support them is what that slide was trying to get across. So like internally, we don't do much with it. Okay. Um, but if people came and wanted to use it, um, we we don't turn away any customer with any distro. So you could literally build your own distro and come use it and our support team would help you with it. They'll try their best to help you with that, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. This might be a little out of scope, but uh, do you foresee uh, Azure Linux uh, replacing WSL or kind of moving into that local area? Yeah, internally today you can use Azure Linux as a distro in WSL. Um, it also powers WSLG, um, and then I think longer term we're looking at releasing it as a distro on WSL externally as well. But that would be like more like six months to one year down the line. Yeah, it wouldn't replace WSL. So like today on WSL, it's Ubuntu um, that you can use. It would just be another distro mm -hmm. that we would yeah. have support for. Mm -hmm. It's WSLG. It's the graphical version of WSL. So you can, with WSLG, you, you pretty much get a GUI for the distro environment on your Windows box, yeah. Is that related to the special graphics drivers you have to do with X, like X11 forwarding kind of thing? I, I'm not sure about that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Cool, well, we'd love to see you all at our community call. And if you think of any questions between now and then, you can uh, ask them there, or you can connect with us on LinkedIn, too. And I'll be at the social clinics for those there. So see you guys yeah. there. <laughs> Thanks for attending, guys. Thanks. Thanks.